You may be seated. We read from scriptures a while ago talking about Peter and his uh, bad fishing trip, which turned into a, quite an awesome fishing trip. I've been on the Sea of Galilee multiple times. This is also the same as the Lake Gennesaret. And uh, one of my favorite things to do is when we're on the boat is to just, we're out in the middle, just stop the engines, float along, enjoy the view. And I usually open up to this little passage of Scripture where it tells this particular story because I think there's a tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, information, insight, lesson to be learned from what Peter's experiencing here, and it's a lesson, obviously, that he learned about failure. Lord, we tried all night, and we just, just failed, amen? And so I thought this would be a, a good message to share with you today. This will probably be the last message I preached for some time here at Believer's Fellowship. Some of you may not know, but I did... Uh, resigned my position as, a, as an elder and, uh, from the board and shared that with the, the leadership of the, of the elders. I'll share a little bit of that letter. It says, um, per our board meeting, Spring Mag Magnolia Campus Elders, on July 15th, I graciously notify the elder counselor that I'm officially resigning my position as an elder of Believers Fellowship Baptist Church as of the date of this meeting. Seeing that my last day of service to the body of Christ is August 31st, 2024, I felt best to remove myself from this distinguished group of godly men. It's been an incredible honor to serve our church in this capacity. I never take lightly, never took lightly the immense responsibility that we have been commissioned with in Scripture. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4 says, Shepherd the flock of God. What a privilege and what an honor. The men who serve in this manner must always exude honesty, character, wisdom, and proven maturity as the Scriptures dictate. Thank you all so much for being who God called you to be. You served me over the years as your pastor. You served our body with both grace and wisdom. My prayers will continue to be for this great fellowship and the new yet to be announced Believers Fellowship in Magnolia, Texas. Both campuses have a glorious future before them. So long as we keep our hearts and our minds on serving God and serving his flock, it's never about any of us singularly. To God be the glory. 
I love each and every one of you and be praying that even in, even in differences that you will always practice patience, patience and grace with each other. Seek your wisdom from God's Word. Love the church deeply. Follow Christ wholly. Blessings, Pastor Joe. As I shared that with them, over, just looking over all the years and ministries, and, you know, um, I preached a couple months ago what I thought would be the last message. You know, Gary surprised me with, and thank you, by the way, Pastor Gary, for letting me have this opportunity these last four Sundays. It's been a real privilege and a, and a real honor. But uh, I did, I've shared a lot what was on my heart in the last weeks and months that we've been together. But uh, this message today is called, you know, the ministry of failure. And I share this because, one, it's kind of a spinoff from what I preached on last week when I said, what to do when you don't know what to do. And too often when we don't know what to do, we just do something, and that usually ends up in failure. So I thought this would be a, a good spinoff of that in case you've done what you weren't supposed to do and you've ended up in some type of failure. So hopefully this will be a continued add-on to what the Lord was saying to there. But uh, I look at Peter, and I see this moment. This is the beginning of ministry for him. This is his call to ministry. And right off the bat, he has to learn a very important lesson. Uh, I think all too often we're in this thought process that's not kingdom-minded, and it's not, it's not Jesus-minded, and it's not spiritual. And like I said last week, we make decisions. And they seem to be good decisions in the moment. They're moral decisions. They're ethical decisions. I mean, we make a decision. And, and, but I said last week, remember, with every decision you make, it sets you on a course. That, that decision is going to take you somewhere, whether you like it or not. And, and Jesus shared that last when he said, really, there's just two roads. There's a broad road, narrow road. Uh, you get on that road, you're not going to like the end result. That's the Joram's translation, all right? That road leads to destruction, and it's a popular route. Everybody's on that road. But then there's a narrow road, and it's not a popular route, not, not a lot of people on that. And he talks, uh, Paul put it this way. He talked about the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world. And one thing as Christians, we've got to always be making sure that as we make decisions, even small decisions in our life, that we're, we're pursuing that not the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom of God. Now, I know that in our thinking, <clears throat> because when we do fail, instead of admitting our failure, we like to kind of come up with justifications and, and excuses. Well, I did the right thing. Well, it might have been right, in a, again, in a moral sense or an ethical sense, but was it a spiritually right thing? Was it, was it the will of God? I guess that's what it boils down to. Paul, in making reference to the, the blindness of the Jews who were zealously following Yahweh God, he said, you know, the, uh, I, pr I pray for my brother's Israel because they have a zeal without knowledge. And I, all too often in my life, I've had that zeal <laughs> and without knowledge and made a decision that really wasn't thoughtful, wasn't prayed over, wasn't taking time to consider, and it took me someplace I didn't want to be. I ended up in the wrong place. So the, the, the beauty about a Christian failure, you know, the Bible says a righteous man falls seven times, get backs up. We, we can have, be redeemed from that. We, we can be forgiven that. We can get right with God. But it still doesn't give us an excuse to keep making bad decisions. So we've been called to put on the mind of Christ. That's a whole new life. To, to die to ourself, our self-logic, our self-opinion, our self-will, our self-way. But all too often it raises its ugly head up. This is a great, great passage from Mark where he talks about, you know, this, that here, here's Peter and uh, the James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and they're partners in the fishing business. They got two boats, all right, and they've been fishing all night, and they, they've caught nothing, as the Scripture said, and Jesus shows up. Now, you know something's getting ready to happen when Jesus shows up, amen? Jesus shows up, and then the crowd shows up because Jesus is there, and they come out to, to hear the Word of God. There it is. I'm looking for this. Well, they come to, he to hear the Word of God, and they, they, there's so many of them, they keep pressing upon them. It's kind of like paparazzi today when they see a star. Everybody just runs in and presses against them. So he's running out of shore <laughs> to stand on. Uh, he can walk on water. He's saving that for later, all right? <laughs> there's two boats, it says, and he gets in one. He tells Peter, you know, catch that a little bit. And it says he teaches from there. It's interesting. That I, I don't know exactly what happened there. I try to put a little sanctified imagination in this every once in a while, you know. But, you know, I don't see him asking Peter's permission to get in Peter's boat. He just gets in the boat and says, cast out. Now, Peter's already had an encounter with the Lord already. You remember uh, his brother took him to see Jesus, all right? And so he, he knows a little bit who this Jesus is. But he's still a fisherman. And he cast out a little bit longer later. And I'm sure... You know, that, that he's, he's thinking, I'm tired. We have to do this, you know. He's probably going to preach too long. I'm going to miss the ball game, whatever else. I don't know. <laughs> but the people are there, and they're there to hear the Word of God, all right? 
And the Bible says he gets in the boat and he teaches people from the boat. But he's not through. He ends teaching the people, and then he teaches Peter in the boat. He's in the boat with him. And that's where we need to start bringing our mindset to in the process of decision-making, is that God's not here on the outside kind of looking in and hoping I do the right thing. He's involved. I have the living presence of God in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. The Holy Spirit abides in each one of us who know Christ Jesus personally. It's an inside job, and he's working from the inside out. There's a lot of people who think Christianity is working on the outside in. I'll quit doing this. I'll quit doing that. I'll start doing this. I'll start doing that. And they get, all the, they get the X's and the Y's and all the things just put where they're supposed to be, but yet their life is still empty. There's no joy. There's no abundance. There's no, no, no real satisfaction. And there's really not any success. But Peter's getting ready to experience. He's going to go very rapidly from a night of failure to a day of success. And it's important you catch what we're talking about here because it's, 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 it's the Word of God and God is speaking to us. I believe that when I got saved, when I gave my life to Jesus, that I, I received in that moment this new creation, the ability to, to, to know the Lord's will for my life. And He doesn't speak it in audible words into my ear. He speaks it through His Word. He speaks it through, 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 through uh, His Holy Spirit given peace. He can even speak it through, as we talked about last week, seeking godly counsel. But he, he deals with us, and he's, he's in the boats, so to say, amen? And he gives Peter direction while he's in the boat to, to do what he's supposed to do. This is where these unique words come up in Scripture for the word word. The word is a, in English, it's just word. In Scripture, it's translated two different ways. There's the word, which is logos, which means a spoken word, written word. Uh, you know, uh, this, this is the, the logos, the word of God, the written word of God. Jesus is the living logos word of God. But he's also that other word, a rhema. Rhema has been really mistranslated, I think, in modern cultures today, in churches at least. But it has to do when God gives you a word, when God speaks something specific to you. You know, and, and I, it comes from his word. It comes by his spirit. It's, it's testified by the word of God. It's testified again by the peace from the Holy Spirit. You just know. Now, your mind may be wrestling against it, all right? Peter may be sitting over here saying, oh, man, we did this all night long. I don't want to cast out the boat. We're tired. The nets are messed up. They got seaweed, and we got to get all the knots out. We got work to do, and you're telling me to cast the nets out again. You know, I'm a professional fisherman. You know, you come from Carpenter Town up there in Nazareth. Uh, you know, I know what I'm doing here. And the fish, the fishing, the best fishing is done at night, and this time of day is no fishing. I know what I'm doing. But God's got a way of speaking to our hearts that might just cut right against our know what we're doing mindset. I know what I'm doing. And how often I've said that to the Lord when he just said, I don't think you do. <laughs> I know you don't. I have something specific I want to say to you about your situation. I remember listening to a preacher for years that was a real mentor in, in many ways of mine, a guy named uh, uh, Manly Beasley. He was an evangelist. And Manly used to talk about getting a report. He said, it's important to get a report. So what do you mean by get a report? He said, it's just that time and that moment when God speaks to you and you know what you're supposed to do. It's a report. Remember the 12 spies, they go into to the, to the land of Canaan, 10 come back with a negative report, 2 came back with a, with a God report. They saw everything everybody else had seen, all right? They, they came back, 10 came back, said, this is not a good business decision, this is not a wise decision, this is, not a good, this is not a good decision based upon our armies and looking at the stature of our guys and the, the size of our, 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 our military and the means by which we have to operate and to win this battle. We don't have what it takes because we've been into the city. We, we're professional spies. You know, we know what it's going to take. We're military. We're the heads of the tribes. I've been selected by the heads of the tribes. We were sent for a reason, and we can't go in there, and we cannot possess the land. There's walled cities. Their armies are big. There's giants in the land. They outnumber us. It's just impossible. Two came back with another report. See, they got the report, the good report. And the good report says, the land is yours. The Lord has promised it. Go take what God's given you. And I'm hoping that most of you sitting here now, you understand what I'm talking about in getting a report. We face a decision. We're not sure what to do. We, 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 we seek the Lord's face, and he gives us what we're supposed to do. And many times, it's not what we want to do, is it? It's not what we would enjoy doing many times. 
but it's the will of God. It's, it's that, that's that rhema. That's that revelation moment. It's like when the lights come on. That, that's how you, you came to Christ that way. You heard the gospel. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You heard the gospel that you're a sinner needing a savior. There's nothing left for you in all of eternity but hell. You're condemned because of sin. As everyone is born into, uh, since Adam and Eve, condemned in sin. But then the good news comes that Jesus Christ said, he that believeth not is condemned already, but he that believeth is not condemned. That light, that word becomes light into your heart. And you realize that you need a savior. You realize in that moment, the lights are coming on, that you need to trust Christ. And you, you, you choose in that moment to renounce the old person and choose Jesus. And man, your life's changed. What happened? You believe the report. <laughs> you got a good word. You got a rhema word. You were saved. And God forever changed life based upon what he said. It's the difference between something being uh, objective and subjective, all right? Uh, it's objective what Jesus is saying to the crowds. It's subjective what he's saying to Peter because he's getting a word just for this moment. He's given very clear instructions. And when the Lord gives us clear instructions, when we've waited to the Lord and we've sought to hear what he say, it's, it's so important to do like Mary at Cana told, told those servants of the household. They said, whatever Jesus tells you to do, do it. Now, that's pretty good instruction, amen? Whatever he says. I don't know what he's going to tell you because he comes up some weird things. I've raised this boy from the days born. <laughs> but whatever he says, that's what you're to do. And that's what they did, and they saw the miracle, obviously. Peter has a word, though, of his own regarding this process. Lord, come on. We, we've done our very best We've worked all night long. We've labored. We have accomplished nothing. And he's about to discover something very unique, that your very best, at its best, is only what you can accomplish. Your best, at its very best, is only what you can accomplish. But when we're moving in faith, we're moving according to what God's spoken to us, we're moving according to his will and his purpose for our life, it, it brings about this supernatural move of God in our life where we begin to experience God on a whole new level. And God begins to work. And he's getting ready to move from failure of what he can do to success of what God can do when obedience and trust and faith happens. Nobody likes to fail. Amen? Charlie Brown said, um, you know, the great theologian Charlie Brown from Peanuts, it makes no difference if you win or lose until you lose. <laughs> Churchill said, success, success is the ability to go from failure to failure with enthusiasm. Why? Because we'd never really fail. We're moving forward, all right? We're learning a lesson. Something's happening. God's doing something alive. And it's in Peter's failure that he's getting ready to learn an important lesson that every one of us has to learn. That in our failure, if we make the right decision in those moments of failing, and we will fail, then God can do something unique in us. God can do something special in our lives. God can obviously bring grace and forgiveness and restoration. But sometimes we get so surrounded and so drowned by our, our defeat and our failures. Like, well, this is never going to work out. Nothing ever is going to come from this. It's just not going to happen the way it's supposed to happen. And then you fail because you just give up. Here's some things I think that failure helps us with. One, failure reveals our personal inabilities. It reveals our inabilities. And failure brings us to that place where we begin to realize, I need God. I really need God. Now, tragically, most of us have to go through some crisis event or some tremendous failure before we get to that first initial step of needing God. But hey, praise God for the failure because it brought you to the place to introduce you to the reality of, of the will of God. Again, let's get back to Peter's mindset. I'm a professional fisherman. This is not my first rodeo. I know what I'm doing. I know how to do this. I've been doing this all of my life. I did this with my dad. He did it with his dad. I fished with grandpa. I fished with dad. I know how to fish, and this is not really a good time for fishing. And what's he find out? Whenever God speaks, it's a good time. I think it's like parenting, you know. Well, I'm parenting. I'm trying to raise my kids the way my parents raised me. Or some go with it. I don't want to do anything my parents did. <laughs> And we have this whole mindset. We know how to do it. You know, you know I, I tell you, my first vulnerable moments as, as, as a dad was when they handed me the baby. 
You know, I'm looking at this baby and I'm kind of like, what am I supposed to do with this? You know, I'm, I'm a dad now. I'm a father now. And it didn't change him on the second one. I got, first one was a girl, now I got a boy. I'm just getting used to girl things. Now, now I got to do a boy thing, you know. What am I going to do with this? I mean, I can go back and look at the dad book, you know, dad, here's the way dad did it. Or the mom book, here's the way mom did it, you know. Or, or, or here, here's a tragic book, never, never, never seek to learn from this, the teen book. The teen book is, you know, all, that's the book of what everybody else is doing. Let's, let's do what those are doing because that, that's, that's the thing to do because everybody else is doing that. But in ministry, in which we are all called to and we all should be, the most important book is the Word of God. This book right here, you can't ignore it. You can't stay away from it. You must absorb it. You must read it. You must believe it. You must open this book and realize that this is a living book. This is the living Word of God. And it overrules the mom book, the dad book, the teen book, the fishing book. Every other book is overruled. I say, well, I've been doing this on It's overruled by what the Spirit of God is going to say to you through His Word. So the story goes. All right? Peter sets out to do something. After he's done everything he can do, at his best, it's failed. He's getting ready to experience what it means to have God do something in his midst and through him and with him. And he sets out, drops the net. And I think there's an important word here. He, he may have been rolling his eyes, you know. <laughs> he may have been thinking, oh, this guy, everybody's watching, I better do it, you know. Who knows what's going through his mind. Or maybe thinking, hey, this might work. It doesn't give us that much insight, but we'll see a little moment, a little bit of the insight. But he, he lets the nets down, and we know what happens. But first and foremost, failure re reveals our inability. And if we can't come to the place of seeing that, hey, I'm just not, I'm not, I'm not cut out for this. The Christian life's impossible. I can't, I can't do this. It's impossible. I, I can't do it. But what happens when I, when I study the book and get a revelation that I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength? Things begin to change. But if I don't get to this place of my inability and recognize my inability, I, I'm not going to go forward. Failure also causes us to seek Him, all right? I believe it, it brings us to a place where we get to the end of us. And by the way, the end of us is the starting point with God. If we can get to that point, we're coming to a real good place in our point in life, all right? When there's no place to look but up, you're in the right place. Now, most of us don't want to get to the place because we're thinking, oh, the, the place of looking up, that means I'm down in the, in the pit, down in the rut, down in, in the hole. I, I'm, I'm, it's going to be miserable. Hey, it's okay to be stripped bare of everything else and just need God. That's not something we should run from. In fact, we should be running to Him. And literally, failure gets us to that place to realize, hey, hey, something supernatural can happen here. God can do something, but I got to get to the place where, I, where I, I'm, I'm truly, honestly looking to Him for the next step. Maybe you're facing something today. Maybe you're dealing with something today. I mentioned several people last week we talked to. It was pretty much the same this week in talking to people. Uh, calling, wanting a word of counsel or decision process that need to be made or something going on that, that, that you know, they say, here's my first inclination. Uh, it's, it's always best to step back after first inclinations and wait for a word from God. Yeah. And it could be that first inclination was the Lord, but you need to weigh it out with the word of God and with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But get to the place where you're not afraid to seek God. I mean, seek God, not, 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 I mean, people, I need to get a word from God. No, what you need is God. He'll give you the word. I don't remember who it was that said it many years ago. The first time I heard it, it says, you know, nobody wants to seek God or seek God's face because we're too busy seeking God's hand. We want something from God. We want God to do this or God to fix that or God to change that. And God, if you'll do that, then, then, I, then I'll be available. Failure causes us to seek him. But also, I'm punching. He's not paying attention. Number three, failure allows the supernatural to take place in our life. I'll let you take over it back there or get me back on the page. It, re it reveals, it causes us to seek him. Number three, failure allows us to, go back one, two, three, get down to number three if you can. The supernatural to take place in our life. I do believe that Christianity is a supernatural life. I do believe all my heart. I, I believe that we should be looking to God for that which is not just natural all the time, but we should be looking to God for his intervention in our life for his, his preoccupation with our life, with his moving in our life. He obviously saw something happen here. They had a boatload of fish, all right? I mean, it's, that's pretty, it, was, it was a big supernatural thing. In fact, it was such a supernatural event, they had to bring others in on it. They had to call for the other boat, his partner. 
But isn't that the way it really works in our life when God starts moving and we start listening and we start paying attention and move from our failure to hear from God? What happens? It always involves somebody else. It involves others. God, God didn't save me just to get me to heaven. All right? Praise God. That's part of it. But it's not about me living for me now and getting from God, but I want God. I want to know your will. Why? Because I just want to know your will. What if I tell you it involves other people? I don't know if I want that. I just want to know your will. Can I get something? Well, I'll give you something. I want you to give it away. No, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not it. I want something, and I want to keep it. <laughs> That's the world we live in. Always seeking self. Always number one. Always, you know, got to look out for you first. It's the, it's the, it's the age of humanism and self and self-seeking and self-enlightenment. That's what everybody's looking for. But when you start getting God involved in your life, God starts doing some things. How many times have you witnessed this? The things that should, that just can't be explained. I mean, you just can't explain it by, by human mindsets or understanding. And you were part of it, and you witnessed it, and it was a God thing. I mean, I can't tell you, that really ought to be more the norm of our life, not, not, the, not the extraordinary of our life. We ought to be used to seeing God move, and we know God's moving because he's doing it me. Now I can share it with others, and God's doing it them as well. It says God begins to move here, and the Bible says, they were astonished. It might have been said amazed in your Bible. It's, it's the word thombos. It means to seize something. They were seized by this moment at the large catch of fish. We sing it so often, I think we forget it. Amazing grace. It is amazing. It's incredible. It's phenomenal. That God meets me in the times of, uh, of need. That God meets me in the times of, uh, of, of, of hurt. And God meets me in the times of pain. And God meets me in the times of sorrow. And he just speaks the word and brings healing and brings grace and brings sufficiency. And not just sufficiency, he brings abundance. But again, it's so that others can be involved in it. We say love God, love people, reach the world. It's really about outside of ourselves and living outside of ourselves. So they're saying, I, the crowd's astonished, obviously. They didn't say much about him, but I'm sure they're all going, what? And Peter's freaking out. And I don't know how he, who's, he, apparently it, it's just him and Jesus. And I'm sure Jesus is participating. But the boat's about to sink because they're catching so many fish. And the other guys get out there quickly. And they start bringing in the net with them, and their boat's about to sink. And there's this supernatural supply of God's grace and mercy. How is it that we don't, we don't experience that in our life? I think we don't experience it in life because we don't give God the, the platform on which to work in our life. We're too busy filling the platform ourselves. We don't give the opportunity to speak to us or even through us. It's the beauty of failure, though, is this, and this is what Peter learned here. Failure brings us to the place of humble discipleship. Peter realizes what? This is a lot of fish. That's not what it says. Peter realized, hey, we have to bring two boats, man. We're going to make a ton of money on this deal. That's not what it says. It didn't say, Peter realized, you know, if I can get Jesus in partner in the business, we're going to make some money. <laughs> we do this every day. You know, the, we're going to kill it. It doesn't say that's what Peter, that's the way we think though, isn't it? Oh, Jesus, just bless my business. I can make a lot of money. I'll give you a little bit. <laughs> I'll pinch off a little section for you. We just miss it all completely. Peter realized his sinfulness, it says in verse 8. Forgive me, I am a sinful man. Well, how do you get that out of a bunch of fish? Because it goes beyond, he wasn't looking at the fish. I think he saw his life, not only his night of failing, of fishing and failing that night, but I think he saw his life as a life, no matter what he brought in that boat, there's still something missing. There's something, something he's missing here. And this was such an act and a, and a supernatural act, and don't take away from it the, the least bit. This is a, a miracle moment, but he's not so caught up with the miracle that's been given is the one who gave it. This is how we know revival is starting to happen in our heart and life. Not because we had a great, powerful worship service. The band was awesome. The sermon was great, you know. We might even have a little tear, you know. Might even felt, maybe I'll go to the altar and pray, right? Really pushing the limit, right? <laughs> but when we see the majesty and the awesomeness and the holiness of God, 
Isaiah had that experience in Isaiah 6. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train, his glory filled the temple. There were angels flying about the throne singing, holy, holy, of holy. Six-winged creatures. With two, they, with, with two they, 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 they covered their eyes and face saying, he is so holy we can't even look upon him. They had no sinful nature. That's just how majestic God is, even to the nature of the angel who hasn't sinned, who stands in the presence of God day and night. And Peter gets a little glimpse of the glory of God, of just how grand and holy and magnificent and incredible and awesome, how amazing this grace is. Words can't explain it. But you know when you experience it. You know when that happens. I shared in one of the Wednesday night services, and I, to, I told them that Wednesday night that I, that I haven't shared this probably more than a couple of times in 35 years or really even 50 years of ministry. Is that shortly after I'd given my life to the Lord and was broken before the Lord, a real pliable time in my heart and life, I went to bed at night and I was reading the crucifixion, just studying the scripture and the Bible, just began to realize the, the glory of God, the grace of God, the love God had for me. And I just started crying. I just, I just cried and cried and cried and I just cried and cried and cried. I don't know how long it went on, but I cried a lot. <laughs> now, I'm not a big crier, you know. And it was just, I, 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 there were multiple things that were happening in my heart. But I, one, I believe, was a time of deliverance. I'd been involved in a lot of ungodly stuff before I met Christ. And I believe he's just setting me free. But it's also just a time of really of seeing the cross of Jesus Christ and what it really cost him and looking at my own heart. And seeing just, no matter how I would try to justify myself, I hadn't killed anybody, I hadn't robbed anybody, so I thought about it perhaps, but I hadn't done it. <laughs> But how just unholy my heart and life was. And what a failure I was. And just to experience the grace of God in that way. There's so many things that happen in our life when we start really getting a glimpse of God's glory in our life. But we have to come to a place, you know, and sometimes it's in sorrow and difficulty. Sometimes it's in this moment of abundance where Peter's so blown away by this abundance that now he gets a glimpse of the grace of God and the glory of God and the holiness of God. God, God will bring us to this place in our lives. There's Psalms 40. I think I might have even alluded to this, this psalm last week. But in Psalms 40, verses 1 and 2, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. Boy, what a great promise of God. Because every one of us, whether they're there today or there last week or the, there'll be a day in the future when we get to that plate where we just feel like we're in a pit and we're in muddy clay and it just, I mean, we've dug a deep hole for ourselves and we just have a tendency to start continuing to sink in it. He said, but when I, I was in that place, I sought the Lord, I waited for the Lord and he heard me and he brought me up. That's, that's a heart of humility. That's where I'm not trying to Tell God how what a privilege it is to know me. What a blessing he got when he saved me. No, it's a place of humility. It's humility in my walk with him. Hey, it's humility in my walk with you and your walk with me and our relationship with each other. We don't rejoice when one falls or stumbles or gets hurt or suffers in some way. What do we do? We, we don't pass them over. We don't reject them. We don't look as an opportunity to take a step above them. We come to them, and we love them, and we stand with them. And that's the beauty of Believer's Fellowship. For so many years, this, that's this church. When someone has fallen, whether it's been a deep failure in a, their moral life or it's been just a, a difficulty that they're going through in their life, how so many of you have just stood by their sides and loved them like true disciples of Jesus Christ. We need to come to this place in our life like Peter. who came to the point where he thought, hey, you know, whatever you want, Lord, and what did the Lord say? The Lord calls him at this point. It's usually in these moments of brokenness that we hear the Lord. You can go back to Isaiah 6 and see that. What happened when Isaiah saw the Lord? He said, then I heard the Lord. After he cleansed me, then I heard the Lord speaking. And so often we don't hear the Lord because we haven't got to this point of brokenness and this point of humility. We're still kind of wallowing in our failures. 
Still thinking, hey, I've got this. I can handle this. I'm going to do this. No matter what they say, no matter what he does, no matter what, I got this. I know what I'm doing. And we just keep pressing through. And, 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 and we just become stubborn. And we miss the word of the Lord. The Lord says, all right, Peter. That's how you catch fish. If you want to know how to really do it. But I don't want you fishing for fish anymore. You're going to be fishers of men. The translation he says, you're going to catch men. To catch is what it is. It's not really even that accurate. It's the word zogorn in the Greek language, and it literally means to take something alive, like taking animals alive for, for a circus or for a zoo. You go get them for a reason. He says, you're going to take men alive for me. When we take them, they come alive in Jesus Christ. And too much, I think, of our evangelism is not conducted that way. We're, we, we're trained to go out and get people to say, yes, 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 sign the card. Are you this? Yes. Have you done that yet? Do you believe this? Yeah. Would you pray this prayer? Okay, sign the card. <laughs> and there's no real brokenness in their heart, and there's no real surrender in their life, and they, they may come to church for a while, and, but they don't last long. The Bible says like the, like the sower, the siege, and the, the, it springs up for a little bit, but then the tribulation, the trials of the sun, they go away. But if you really want to know what P Peter's been called to, you call this big-time hunting, big-time catching. And it's not like, you know, I love, I love fishing, I love hunting. You know what I don't like about fishing and hunting? A limit. <laughs> they give you this piece of paper, and you can have so many tags on it, you know, and you get to use that only so many times. And for that perspective, and if it's over this size or under that size, this way, you're going to get to keep it. I know those are good rules for good reasons, but I'm just saying I don't like it. When it comes to fishing for men... We're taking people alive for Jesus, and there's no limit. And there should never be a limit in our life. And I really do believe, again, this is a witness. This is a, this, this, this is a, a testimony. This is a, this is a true picture of what it really means to be broken for the Lord. No longer is Peter concerned about himself. Hey, you're going to be concerned about others now. How do I know if I'm, I'm really broken for the Lord? I'm concerned about others now. God's starting to use me with a burden to reach others. But I... I've got to come to this place of failure before I can ever come to the place of success in my life. Success revolves around, let me go back to this, getting a word from the Lord. How do I get a word from the Lord? I abide in the word. I read the word. I study the word. I listen to what God's saying. I get that report as I talked about. And I hear what the Lord says, and that's what I need to do. Where are you in your walk right now with God? What is God doing in your life right now? Has he got something he wants you to do? Maybe you're not hearing, or maybe you've heard it, but you're not necessarily you want to do it. What's the next step here? Well, I believe the important step is just getting this word. Peter got a word. It was a personal word. Get in the boat. Bring your nets. All that's involved there. He knew it wasn't involved. Get in here. We're going, we're going to go fishing again. It was practical. In fact, it's something, he's not asking him to do something he didn't know how to do. He just didn't do it very good the day before. He said, so it's, it's simply a, a practical word. God's going to meet a need, a real need of fish. I mean, they didn't have any fish. They're getting ready to find some fish. It was a promise word, though. This is, the, this is the beauty of when God speaks to us. This is the beauty of that report I'm talking about. When God does speak, he's doing it for a reason. He's doing it for a purpose. He has something he wants to do in your life and with your life and through your life. So you've got to hear what he has to say. It's a promise. When Jesus told the dead man to get up, it meant he could. When Jesus told the lame man, lame man to stand and take his bed and walk, it meant he could. But he can't. He's lame or he's dead. The word spoken made it a reality but you have to trust him and at that point not only is it a, a promise word it's a powerful word god demonstrates he comes along with his mercy he comes along with his grace he comes along with the anointing he gives you everything that you need for all those moments in your life but unfortunately all of it's wasted all that god wants to do in our life and all that he wants to do through our life so much of it we just waste away we're not paying attention. We're not listening. We're not focused. Instead of becoming more alive and vibrant and full of zeal for the Lord, we just become hard and bitter and deeper in our bondage, and wallowing in our personal shames and future shame to come. Where are you? Well, Brother Joe, I'm in a failing moment in my life. But why don't you hear what the Lord has to say to you? I read that this morning when I was looking over my notes again this morning. I came across this, and it said failure. Lord, are you trying to tell me something? For failure does not mean I'm a failure. It only means I've not yet succeeded. It doesn't mean I've accomplished nothing. It does mean I've learned something. 
It doesn't mean I've been a fool. It doesn't mean I've had enough faith to experiment. It doesn't mean I've disgraced. It doesn't mean I've tried, dared to try. It doesn't mean I don't have it. It does mean I have something to do in a different way now. It doesn't mean I'm inferior. It does just mean I'm not perfect. Failure doesn't mean I've wasted my life. It does, it does mean that I have an excuse to start over now. It does not mean that I should give up. It does mean I should try harder. It doesn't mean that I will never make it. It does mean that I just need to practice more. It doesn't mean that you've abandoned me. It does mean that you have the better idea. And it does mean that. We said a while ago, the righteous will fall down seven times. But it gets back up. If we don't get back up, we miss God. So where are you in your walk? As a Christian, there's going to be times over and over and over again, ultimately, that we we experience this and have to come back and learn this lesson. Now, you shouldn't have to be learning the same lesson over and over and over. All right? You should have learned that lesson, and let's move on to the next lesson. I think two minutes are like the children of Israel. We're stuck to wandering around the same old mountain for 40 years. Amen? And all the time God's saying, okay, it's time to step over the river Come on into the promised land. Be what I've called you to be. I trust that the Lord will take whatever has been shared this morning, put it in your heart, and you would see if there's something there. If it's been a failure, then you would just say, yes, Lord, I'm taking you at your word today. I'm moving forward with you. I'm leaving this behind. You are forgiving me. Your blood covers me. I don't have to live in guilt. I don't have to live in shame. I don't have to live in doubt. I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to live with regrets. It's under the blood, which means it's forgotten. As far as the east is from the west, cast into the sea of God's forgetfulness, and nothing comes up from there, ever. Thank God for that. Would you stand with me with your heads bowed? Father, we love you today. And I believe, Lord, when you speak a word to us, even something as simple as this is today, that it's for purpose and it's for reason. And I pray, Lord, whatever you've said to whatever man or woman or young person heard this message today, if it was just one thing, that they would bring that to bear before you at this moment. They'd acknowledge you in it, agree with you in it. If forgiveness needs to come, they would confess it before you, and they would find a moment of grace and healing at this time. We do plead the blood of Jesus over our lives today. We do thank you, Holy Spirit, that you live in us. And we do love you today for who you are. Lord, it is in our hearts, it's in our minds, in our very spirit to follow you. So forgive us when we act foolishly and we fail. May we find your success by surrendering. With your heads bowed in this moment, if the Lord did say something to you, it is incumbent upon you to acknowledge it to him. Say, yes, Lord. Maybe you don't know what's fully involved. Just say, yes, Lord. Guide me. Yes, Lord, instruct me. Yes, Lord, help me. We praise you today, Father, for you're a good, good God and a good, good Father. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Brother Gary. couple of closing announcements. Uh, first is we are going to have a special call meeting immediately after church next Sunday. Uh, so as we progress through the transition and the birthing of Magnolia Church or Believers Fellowship Church of Magnolia, we need to vote and approve on new trustees for Believers Fellowship Spring. And so the elders voted and are presenting before the body uh, three trustees. They are Bill Robertson, myself, and Jimmy Cabrera. And so next Sunday after church, um, members, well, anybody that wants to stay, if we have church business, we're transparent, uh, but members, voting members, will have the opportunity to vote on their trustees. And it's to sign legal documents, legal paperwork, because we will be uh, transferring land to Magnolia as they purchase that. 
And so those trustees will need to be there to sign those documents. And then we'll have our church business meeting Wednesday, August 28th. We are moving to a, from a uh, 112 of January to December uh, budget to a fiscal budget, which is September to August. And so we'll present that budget um, for a, to the members on August 28th. Also, next, next week, next Sunday, we're going to have the Lord's Supper and then an ordination service. So nine years ago, Pastor Matt was ordained as a pastor. We are going to ordain him next Sunday uh, as a voting elder of Believers Fellowship. And, and so um, you want to come be a part of that to celebrate with him uh, as he becomes, like I said, a voting elder in Believers of Believers Fellowship. Um, he's been uh, instrumental in, in my walk and, and, and for you parents in your children's walk. And so come and celebrate him for that. Awana's registration starts August 4th. Awana kickoff is August 11th. Don't forget our Wednesday night Bible studies. We are extending that. Uh, Next, or the 7th, I think, was supposed to be the last Wednesday. We're going to extend it because of the hurricane. We're going to extend it to the 14th. And then starting August 11th, uh, oh, Women's Rooted Women's Conference is August 10th. There is still time to sign up. Uh, it is here at Believers Fellowship Spring Campus. The cost is a hundred or sixty. I'm sorry, sixty, sixty dollars. Uh, it is. Uh, it's going to be led by Elisa Childers, who is a phenomenal apologist. So you don't want to miss that. Uh, Kiss by Grace will be leading worship that day. And then starting the 11th, I'm going to start a new Bible uh, series, a new sermon series. Uh, been praying about this, and 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 I think it's a it's a important time to to share this word. It's going to be rooted and resilient. It's going to be five weeks. You know, given all the things that are going on in the world, it's important that we're rooted in God's word and that we're resilient in in, in the gospel. And so the first sermon will be um, transformative perspective. What is your worldview? I was looking at an inventory. 92% of of people are are of the worldviews, I should say. 92% have the worldview of what's called synchronism. And it's taking a hodgepodge of all the different worldviews and just accepting it all. Second place was a biblical worldview at 4%. Even within evangelicals, 66% of evangelicals have a synchronist worldview, meaning they're just okay. There might be another way to get to heaven. The Bible might not be the only word of God. And so we're going to be going over who Jesus is, the truthfulness, the truthfulness in the truth. And so you don't want to miss that. That's starting the 11th. Um, finally, if you're a guest of ours, there's a welcome card in the seat back in front of you. I ask that you fill that out at the end of the service. would love the opportunity to meet you, greet you, put a free gift in your hand. Don't forget your tithes and offering, three ways to give online. In person, you can give through the app, or we're here Monday through Thursday. You can drop a check off in the office. With that being said, tell somebody that you're glad to see them. You are dismissed.